Hello and welcome back. If you follow the channel, you know that we are members of the restoration team for the IBM 1401 mainframe at the Computer History Museum. This beast of a computer is giving us job security as it needs constant maintenance, just like the original machine did. Today I get to wrangle with one of the most complicated mechanical keyboards I have ever seen. Note that it is not attached directly to the 1401. Instead, it is part of an IBM 029 key punch which punches cards which are then fed to the computer. Now mind you, the IBM 029 is modern witchcraft introduced in 1964. So an IBM 1401 from 1959 would have had its cards punched by its much older predecessor, the IBM 026, here providing my young daughters with their first encounter with punched cards. But the 029 is an evolution of the 026 and shares a lot of the mechanicals, including much of the DNA of the keyboard. This will become obvious as we dig into its entrails. It really dates back to the time when mechanical engineers roamed and rolled the earth. So today on the bench we have an 029 keyboard that doesn't work because it has been broken by visitors and the A is missing and this is the mother of all complicated keyboards. Well, that's a little bit our fault too. We made an O29 key punch accessible to visitors without supervision, which wasn't one of our brightest moves. As you will see, this keyboard is of the locking kind and the keys won't go down when it's not powered. So what do you do when a key does not go down? If you don't know any better, you press harder. Apparently a lot harder in this case. You cannot push the keys and somebody pushed it so hard that it went past the interlock. And now it's interlocked the other way. Uh, so I have to figure out how to get in there. And I got the documentation for the punch. This is the parts catalog and look at this. This is a work of art. I mean, can you imagine drawing this without a computer? Mr. Engineer, please document your machine. You have just pen, paper, and a ruler. And that's what they came up with. And, and on the side, we're drawing Mona Lisa's, right? <laughs> okay, anyhow, my keyboard is over here. Fortunately, it's a little less complicated. and it has lots of parts and I have the field engineering manual also over here somewhere there I saw there was some keyboard stuff uh, keyboard keyboard uh, that's keyboard there we go so here we have the keyboard. But I would soon discover that these drawings were just simplified high-level assemblies and the instructions were very cursory. The former IBM customer engineers later told me that they rarely repaired one in the field except for simple adjustments. They would send them back to the factory. We will soon find out why. Okay, so it tells me is those Four screws, maybe some more in the front I need to remove first. Let's get to Yes. Okay. Beautiful. Here is the beast. Ok, so far so good. Then it told me to remove four screws to separate the keyboard in its two sub-assemblies, the keyboard itself and the permutation unit. But it was impossible to tell from the picture which four screws they were talking about. No, that wasn't it. That wasn't it. You say follow picture 95, screw hole, screw 
screw holes, screw holes. Those two, which are here, one and one, and these ones, I bet you they are accessible through this. Oh my goodness, I think that's what it is. So I thought I was very clever and discovered the hidden screws, but I wasn't and I hadn't. And believe me, you don't want to touch these screws. Okay. Nope. I think I found it. These little blue guys are here. I eventually figured out that the screws they were referring to were not even visible on the picture. They were on the other side of the assembly. Ah. They were talking about sliding something out and that something might prevent it. So let me read this. Separate the keyboard into its major unit, remove the four screws as shown on figure 95, which doesn't show the four screws. Be careful when sliding the key unit out of the permutation unit. The Y pull bar may hook on center support screw. It's all super mysterious. Maybe one more screw. My keyboard still didn't separate into its two sub-assemblies, so I went after the last screw that was in my way, which you should not touch either. Oh yes, alright. So never mind the four screws that they talk about, it's at least seven. Nope, nope, it's not. Right. It's really four screws. But anyhow, my two units are finally separated. Yep. Woo! We got it. That's the key in question that's stuck. And if you look behind the slider of the key, there is a bar that's preventing it from moving. There you go. Key A repaired. Alright. So it's these bars. Okay. Step one. <laughs> Alright, so how is this complicated thing working? Glad you asked, so I can fire up the elevator music. Here is the mechanism for one key. In red, that's the linkage that we just repaired on the keyboard assembly proper. When you push on the key, it pulls the long horizontal bar to the left via a small link in the middle. That's the link that had jammed on the key stem and that we just fixed by judicious application of screwdriver persuasion. The ultimate result is to move the green bar down, called the permutation bar. When the permutation bar moves down, it triggers the contacts shown in yellow. For this key, three contacts are actuated. We'll look into these in more detail when I screw up things even further in a minute. But for now, let's just mention that these contacts directly actuate the punches for the holes in the card. The complicated intermediate mechanism in blue is the bar actuation and the key latch and restore mechanism. The mechanism locks the key in the down position as soon as it's pressed. That is what IBM calls latching. The key stays latched during the whole punching cycle. Once the holes have been punched and the card has advanced to the next column, the key is then unlatched, which IBM calls restoring. For that, the big electromagnet is fired and will activate the restoring bale and unlatch the key. This latch restore mechanism prevents you from overrunning the punch. You can't start another punch until the machine is ready. Mind you, the O29 punch is pretty darn fast and you have to be a skilled operator to type faster than the punch. But very skilled operators there were, remember that you not only have to type fast but you can't make any errors. There is yet another mechanism in purple, that's the interlock mechanism. 
This mechanism prevents you from pressing another key while one key is latched. So a single latched key will lock the entire keyboard until it is restored. Which is probably what fooled our strong-fingered visitor. When you first try the keyboard on an unpaired machine, the first key will go down normally and latch down with a delicious mechanical click. Then of course you are tempted to try another key, thinking that maybe it will unlatch the one you just pressed, and you want another delicious click of course. But the purple mechanism has interlocked all other keys and since there is no power, the key that's down will never be restored. So all the keyboard is locked. Frustration and key breakage might ensue. Anyhow, that purple interlock mechanism, my friends, is what I have just royally messed up by removing a few too many screws. And interestingly, I ran into another problem. This little discs were starting to fall out. These little washers. And they belong, they were stuck in between this piece and the piece next to it. Yeah, so these little guys which are stuck here they are not supposed to be here, they are supposed to be in there yeah, so I'm going to put them back in okay, I got all my little washers in a row and they are made so that just one of those things can move at a time so it, if I move that one forward it will push all the rows of washers and prevent any other key to be uh, drawn down at the same time. So, we put that back on, and I think we have a major crisis averted. Anyhow, I managed to put the whole thing back together, which involved another epic fight with the springs on top of the permutation bars. But then I found another issue. Let's see the bright side of it. Now we get to look at the latching and restore mechanism. All right, and of course we seem to have yet a new problem. The Z key is not resetting. That's this fellow out here. Z. Z. And it should reset. And it does not. It goes back down. I took the keyboard away from the decoupled it from the permutator, then redid it again and now. Where is my Z key? Not this one. There you go. Is my Z key. You can see how it works. It clicks. It's this one over here and I click it in and when it's clicked nothing else can move and then the electromagnetic resets it and you're ready for the next key here's another one right here I reset it with the electromagnet so that's how this thing works so you, you cannot punch faster than the machine lets you do and I was testing all the keys and guess what I doesn't work. So I have another problem over here. Well, it was easy. I found what it was. I removed the, the cap, and now that key well, except the key is moving freely, and it's broken in here. So see, it's it's an abused key. It's been banged in. To figure out how I'll fix the eye, redo an insert, and uh, put it back together for the emptiest time. And we should be done. Here we go. Mark. Yes. This is a really good one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> to give you the wrong pencil sharpener. And the back pedals go here somewhere. And it's IBM, so it's all nicely done. This is 04. And that's set. Feed. Uh huh. Uh -huh right. Register. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. Well, it's just not correct. No. Auto. It kind of got carried away. Huh. It, it thinks there's. It thinks it's duplicated. 
Well, it thinks I'm pressing something, I think. Nothing. That's not. You can't produce that code though with the keyboard. That's no, 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 no. And it's no. not producing it all the time. All right, I messed up something else. This time I think I know what it is. It's the contacts. I promised you we'd look at those more closely. So here are our contacts again, this time colored in orange for a change. They are of two types, the bail contacts located on either side of the machine and the latch contacts located under each key. Let's look at the bail contacts first. There are 15 of them divided in two sets on either side of the machine. Here is one of the sets, the copper ladder looking thing. Here is a closer view. And here I have run into further trouble and started to disassemble them. You can now see the bail arms that are pushing the contacts. In mechanosaur jargon, a bail refers to a bar shaped moving part that runs the whole width of the machine. And now I have run into even more trouble and my bail bars have fallen off. You can see how the bales can easily carry an arbitrary encoding just by having these little tabs that protrude and engage into the permutation bars at the back of the machine. And as you had seen before, there is also a more traditional contact at the bottom of each key, which you'd think is the only one you'd need. So you end up with this crazy mess where one key can actuate a whole bunch of contacts indicated by the dots on the vertical lines. So for example, the W key actuates three bales off to the side and one latch at the top. How did they ever come up with such a scheme? As always, Masterkin figured it out and I will link his article in the doodly doo. It becomes more obvious when looking at how a punch card is encoded. It has 12 rows of punches. Actually, it started with 10, which encoded number 0 to 9 with a single punch. Later on, they added alphabetic characters, encoding them with two punches per column, and using the two extra rows at the top, bringing the total of punch rows to 12. To punch such a card, 12 bail contacts would suffice, with one contact connected to each punch, hence the original bail contact scheme makes a lot of sense. But there are complications. Consider the O26 keyboard layout. It has numbers in the shifted or numeric position, like a typewriter. How do you handle a key with two characters? Since numbers correspond to a single punch on the card, they just added a contact at the bottom of each of the number keys and used only that contact when the num modifier is pressed. But the O26 also introduced the first special characters. Not many, just 10 of them, concentrated in the four buttons at the upper row on the left. To encode these, codes with three punches per column were introduced. And our beautiful scheme got kludged with the addition of three extra bail contacts for a total of 15, as well as further latch contacts under each of the special character keys. Forward to 1964 and computers are taking over. The O29 punch main innovation is to add many more special characters, used primarily for programming. Its new keyboard has one shift character for every key. But by very clever contact reshuffling, they managed to support it by extending the use of the bottom latch contact to every key. So they kept the 15 bill contacts hence using the exact same mechanical design as the O26 keyboard under a new skin. However, the wiring became somewhat illogical and the simple relationship between punches and bales was lost. Coming back to our W key, you can see that it will punch 0 and 6 in alpha mode, which is indeed a W, and 0, 5 and 8 in numeric mode, which is a triple punch for the special dash character. All this to say that if I am punching stuff when I shouldn't, it's likely because I have a bunch of contacts closed when they should not be. My keyboard is back out once again, and you can see the problem. They are indeed my bail contacts. 
and the little bail things they do work but somehow this is aligned improperly they are always closed and if I do that I can move them up and there is a tolerance here you have to adjust it properly with gauges and I'm just trying to do it like this Anything. Tell us when you're rolling. So we uh, we're rolling. I'm always rolling. Okay, register. Ha! Nice, no, but is it? Yeah! Okay. Register feet. Register. Zero. One, two. Two. No. Doesn't want to be two. Three, four, five, six. Those contacts working fine, and then I have to go through the whole alphabet and make sure it gives me the right thing. So we have a whole bunch, and we don't have the whatever that that key is. Probably the bail, not the key itself, because the key was working fine. And I have to find what where numeric four is, and it's. It's one that they moved over here. You make four. It's that one. So on the back of the keyboard, whatever is on top of key J. Yeah, it's this contact. So I have to bend this guy out a little bit. And see if that did it. <laughs> oh, I think. We can claim a victory. I think we did it. Here we go. And I showed my card proudly to the old timers and they said, well, but are the holes at the right place? And then the way to check is to use this template and you go there and oh, it's perfectly aligned. I've never seen a punch that's better aligned than this. So. Okay, let's see. I'm going to try to type a single card program in machine language. Thank you.